Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is the five-step approach that we use to remove negative items off of a client's credit report and how it's different than your run-of-the-mill dispute letter approach, which is a four-step approach. So there's two different types of approaches used with getting negative items deleted off a credit report. Most of the companies in the industry use a dispute letter writing approach, and we use the same approach a consumer law attorney uses. And there's only one different thing, one step that's different. So I'm gonna explain on the board how a dispute letter approach works, and then I'm gonna explain how our approach works so you understand the difference, okay? So there's three entities that are involved always in either approach. There's the credit bureaus. I'm sorry, the creditors. See, I'm already messing up. There's the creditors. And there's the credit bureaus. And then there's you, the client, right? Do you guys know the difference between the creditors and the credit bureaus? That's okay, not many people do. Let's start with the credit bureaus because that's easiest. Um, you've heard of the credit bureaus, Experian, Equifax, Equifax and TransUnion, Equifax. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll write those down. There's actually four, but three of them that are recognized by banks and everybody. TransUnion. Yeah, TransUnion. Okay, and then creditors are anybody that you could have a loan with, for example, um, collection agencies technically are creditors, and in the, for the purpose of this analogy or this demonstration, we're going to group into that public records like tax liens and all those creditors. But what that really means is these are entities that report to the credit bureaus. So creditors oh, okay. are banks, like Wells Fargo, right? Mm -hmm. B of A, City, Chase. Chase, and then collections and public records, stuff I mentioned. Not technically a creditor. A creditor is really, and this is something for you to record, the exact definition. A creditor is anybody that you have a line of credit with that reports on a monthly basis. That's a creditor. Um, like B of A, I get a car loan with Bank of America, a car loan with Honda. Every month I'm going to get a bill, make my payment. Every month they report to the credit bureaus if I'm making my payment on time or if I'm making my payment late. That's a creditor definition by with the true definition of a creditor. It's a, someone that extends credit. But for this analogy, like I said, we're going to consider them anybody that reports information to the credit bureaus. So I'm just going to kind of show you with a series of arrows. Creditors report to the bureaus. And these guys receive and record information. They don't report information. They receive information and record it. Okay? So creditors report to the credit bureaus. The credit bureaus receive and record information. Okay? And in this sharing of information, there's a law that governs all of this. Okay, so I'm gonna just kind of draw a line through it and write up here, the law that governs sharing of information, right? Is called fair credit reporting act. Have you heard of it? Other than working here? Yes. Fair Credit Reporting Act. F C R A. So you see how the creditors report to the credit bureaus? And the credit bureaus receive and record the information that's being reported? Well in through all of that, through all of that information, there's the law that governs this sharing and receiving of information. It's called the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So in that law, it tells the creditors how they have to report this information, what steps they have to follow to put a bankruptcy on your credit, what steps they have to follow to put a collection on your credit or a late payment, what kind of proof is required if they ask for it. That's part of the law. And then the credit bureau is the same thing. What's governed, how do they receive that information and record it on your credit report. 
all of it's covered by that law, okay? So I'm gonna wipe that off, you got all that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the reason I say that that's important, I'm, I'm wiping it, is because that law was passed for two reasons. And I'm gonna write that down and go over that. Okay, I receive and record information, and they said that, okay, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and for the terms, or for the sake of time, I'm gonna shorten it by writing that, was passed for two reasons. One, to govern the sharing of the info, which I just described to you, meaning the sending and receiving of info. Mm -hmm. The Fair Credit Reporting Act was passed to govern the sharing of that information. So it makes sure that the information is being reported correctly, and it makes sure that the information is being received and recorded on your credit report correctly. That's what I mean by the governing of sharing of info. And the other reason is to give the client, you, um, the right to verify any information, information they're unsure of. Okay, I'm going to go into a little reason behind that so you understand that more. This law was passed back in the early 1970s. I think it was 1971. You can look it up. Um, this law was passed. I'm going to write 1971 up here, but I would love it if you guys would look that up for me. Okay. If I know. Because it's important to say this in your little spiel with the client if you're talking to a client or a lender. Um, the reason that law was passed was to govern the information being shared, receiving and recording the information. The other reason they passed the law was to give you or I the right to verify any information on our credit report we're not sure of, any mistakes that I see. So if I look at my credit report today and it says that I missed a payment on my Honda car loan, I've never had a Honda car loan. What's that about? I have the right to ask for proof from Honda that I had a car loan with them and proof that they reported me late. More importantly, I have a right to prove that they shared that information to the credit bureaus correctly. Prove that you sent that information to the credit bureaus according to the steps that the law says. And prove, the credit bureaus have to also prove that they received and recorded that information and verified it was really you and yours because they could be liable for damages if they made a mistake. And I don't want to pursue damages. So I have the right to verify, ask for verification of that information with this law. So the Fair Credit Reporting Act was passed for two reasons. One of them, to make sure information is being reported correctly and received and recorded by the bureaus. And two, to give me a chance, the client, to verify any mistakes I see on there, okay? Which is where our industry comes about. <clears throat> and the reason, just to give you an idea of the reason behind the logic here, why they created this law way back then, is early on in the 1970s, before the world exploded with the internet and all this other amazing stuff, we didn't have much going on with technology. If you think about it, everything was done by fax, right? Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. So when you made your car payment back then, if you were late, somebody just faxed it over to, they called it the TRW back then, which is the same three bureaus existed, actually only two of them. Back then, it was only Equifax and TransUnion, and I think another one called TRW, mm -hmm. something to look up. Experian came around in 1984. TransUnion came around in the 60s. It used to be TransOil, which was actually a company that was just keeping their clients' records in file cabinets. And they had done such a great job of keeping records that they eventually became TransUnion. Okay. It was an oil company, like a big storehouse for records. Anyway, and then Equifax was the very first one, came around back in the early 1900s. And so they've evolved into the bureaus today. But way back in the 70s, the reason why this law came about was because they, early on, the government saw that there was a need for putting the ownage of verifying this information on the customer. Because there's no credit police out there that are gonna go through your credit report or mine mm -hmm. and check it for mistakes. Why not? Um, the best way I can describe it in the shortest way is, think about this, how many people live in America, right? 300 million is the estimated, it's actually more, but 300 million people, let's just say for round numbers, live in America. Of them, how many people do you think are over the age of 18? I mean, people die around 70, right? And people that are born to 18, there's a larger gap past 18, so people above 18 have credit. People that are born to 18 probably don't. Mm -hmm. So I would say realistically probably 200 million, and that's a low number, have credit, right? 300 million people. 200 million people with credit, that's one third. 
Okay, and then what do you think an average person has on their credit in number of accounts? There's some people with like 50, some people with one. Let's average it at five, all right? Let's just say five is the number. So times this by five, we got one billion. I'm pretty sure five times two is 10. So we got one, two, three, one, two, three. That's 200 million, so we got one billion. Number three. Maybe three more, I don't know. It's a lot, it's one billion, whatever that looks like. Is that a billion? I think that is. So one billion mm -hmm. is 1,000 million, yeah. One billion. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. one billion accounts on 200 million people's credit with five accounts average. That's not very many accounts average. I have more like 10 to 20. You know, in old, old accounts and new accounts, fresh ones combined. But these report, remember it's the sharing and receiving of information mm -hmm. that's um, being governed by that law. This is one billion accounts that are being reported every month on a monthly basis to who? The credit bureaus. They have to record and receive about a billion reports every month. So do you think the credit bureaus could ever go through each one of these billion reports and say, wait a second, before I can put Karen down as making her payment on time mm -hmm. for her Honda car loan, let's just prove, please prove to us that you followed this law and that you're following all the steps that we asked you to follow before we put this on her credit. Now they're waiting for proof, there's a whole process going on, there's no way, it would shut the whole thing down. So the government knew there's no way we can actually check all this every month, there's no way. Yeah. One billion, it would take a whole army of police, credit police to check your credit and mine to make sure that all this information we're receiving is accurate. So what do they do? The Fair Credit Reporting Act, it sets up steps, right? The creditor has to follow, must follow. So before I, the bank, Honda, put you down as late on your credit or on time on your credit, there's a set of steps I have to follow, right? And I have to follow these. It's kind of like, you know, when, when I drive my car, I have to follow the law when it comes to stop signs. But I don't have a policeman in my car following me, going, watching my every move. So it's just on me to make sure that I stop, I wait three seconds, I put on turn signals when I change lanes, I make sure my car has all the lights working properly. These are things that is expected of me as a citizen, and my privilege is I get to drive, mm -hmm. and they're expecting me to follow the laws, right? But we don't all have a, our own individual police officer following us around making sure. That's kind of the same thing here. The creditors are expected to follow the steps, but they don't always do that. They're not always following the steps. They make mistakes, a lot of times on purpose, okay? So, but the bottom line is that law says, here's the steps you have to follow when you're reporting a late payment, a collection, a bankruptcy, a tax lien, a judgment, it's all different steps, but these are what you have to do. Mm -hmm. When you come to a stoplight, there's a different set of steps than a stop sign, but here's what you have to do. Same thing, right? And then this law also governs the steps for recording and receiving, right, mm -hmm. info. Okay, that just kind of spells out those things. Now, it's expected of the credit bureaus and the creditors to follow this law, and there's nobody that's checking them, okay? What I mean by that is there's no credit police out there that are actually going through and checking this stuff randomly. There might be, there might be some people that do this randomly, but the real check happens when the client asks for proof, yes. okay? And that's where we come in. Now there's two different approaches. I'm gonna erase all this, so I'm gonna take a picture for you because this is good info. I know you're videoing, so mm -hmm. take a picture. We can take off of this, Joe. Okay, there's two, take that live. There's, no, I forgot what I was saying. Um, oh yeah, there's two parts of the law, okay? One of them is the creditors and the credit bureaus are expected to follow the law, okay? I'm gonna erase this too. We get the idea of how many people there are, how many accounts there are. 
there's two types, that's what I was saying, there's two types of approaches that can be used to get a client, to fix a client's credit. Um, one of them is the dispute letter approach, which we're going to talk about next. Dispute letters. This is a four step approach. Four steps. And then there's our approach, which is the consumer law attorney approach, which is five steps. Law, law attorney approach. We call it the pre litigation approach. So write that down, Joe. Pre litigation. Five steps. So there's only one step different. So the dispute letter approach is this you, the client, look at your credit report, whether you look at it online or you got it pulled out of mortgage office or you got a notification from Credit Karma or whatever, you get a notice that there's a collection account from Time Warner in your care, and you're going, wait a second, I've never had Time Warner. That was my roommate's shit. How did that end up on my credit? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I have a right to ask for proof that that's really mine, prove that that was reported correctly. So what does a dispute letter approach say you can do, Karen? Just write a letter to the credit bureaus. Just write the credit bureaus a letter and say, hey, this isn't mine, right? Mm -hmm. Now by law, by the law that I just described, the Fair Credit Reporting Act gives you the right to do this. So you go to the credit bureaus and write a letter, yeah. and the credit bureaus in turn receive your letter, and they go to the creditor, and they say, hey, Mr. Creditor, Karen here is asking for proof that this Time Warner account is really hers. Prove it, right? We're asking you to prove it. You have to prove it, the bureaus. The creditor, Time Warner, goes, oh, crap, you know, they want to prove, here's proof. They'll prove it's yours. They send the proof back to the credit bureaus, and the credit bureaus you. notify Karen. Hey, we verified this account. It's really yours, Karen. You're stuck with it. It says here you had a collection with them. You must not turn in a cable box or something. Call them up. <laughs> Deal with it, right? Deal with it. That's pretty much what happens in a dispute letter approach. Um, that's the short and sweet version of the steps. Now let me explain those a little bit more in detail. Okay. When you go to the credit bureaus, you're actually sending in a letter. You're right. You're asking for proof. Then the credit bureaus... You know, request, I'm going to write, request. They request proof from creditor, but the, they're asking for two things from the creditor. They're asking for the creditor to prove that the account really belongs to Karen, right? Which is part of it, part of what they have to prove. The other thing they have to prove, and more importantly, is did you follow all the steps, Time Warner, that are set up in the Fair Credit Reporting Act? Remember the steps? Prove to us, the credit bureaus, that you followed all these steps. Remember what I said, there's no credit police? This is where the police get involved. So this is kind of like your neighbor saying, you know what, Karen hasn't been stopping at this stop sign for the last two years she's lived here. She's drove right through it, and I'm pissed off. Get a policeman down here and catch her. Right? Now mm -hmm. the police are there waiting, and boom, they got you. Karen, you've been, you've been blowing through this light for two years, your neighbor said. Prove that you haven't been. We just saw you go through it, right? Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So now the police are involved. So when you, the client, ask the credit bureaus to look into the account, then they request this proof from the creditor. The creditor has to prove that all the steps were followed and prove the account really belongs to you. Okay? They only have a certain amount of time to do that. 30 days. 30 days. Must prove two things in 30 days. Okay, I just said what they are, but what are they? What do they have to prove, Karen? Remember? I know you're video on But what do they have to, they have to prove the item really belongs to you, and they have to prove that they followed the steps. Okay. So it's not just enough to prove that the item is really yours, Time Warner has to prove that they followed the steps when they reported this to the According U.S. to the FCRA. See what I mean? So let's say it really is your account, but they didn't cross all their T's and dot all their I's when they reported it. Mm -hmm. Now the creditor could be liable for damages in the credit bureau for having misreported information on the credit report. Oh, yeah. See what I mean? So it really is yours, but they didn't report it correctly. So now it has to be deleted because um, they didn't report it correctly. Get it? Yeah. So they have to prove two things. One, it's... The clients, right? Two. They follow the um, steps. Follow the steps, exactly. See? All right? They have to prove two things, and they have to do that within 30 days. 
the government came in, in this law, they said, okay, we've got to give this client the ability, the right to verify information, but we also want to give the creditor a reasonable mm -hmm. amount of time to provide this proof. Mm -hmm. So the client can ask for the proof, the creditor has to prove it in a certain amount of time. They all met, decided when they passed this law that 30 days was a reasonable amount of time. That's what the law says, the creditor has 30 days to prove the account's accurate. So when the creditor runs through and proves the account, they notify the bureaus, the last step, so this is four steps, remember one, two, three, as they prove it, four, update the client, right? This is the yeah. investigation yeah, results. Ooh, with results. Uh -huh. They're doing an investigation for you and they're updating the client of results of investigation. Okay? That's the four-step approach of the dispute letter. Now the consumer law attorney approach we'll go into next. Do you guys understand that pretty completely? Mm -hmm. Pretty accurately, it's pretty basic. Yep. You know, and when I say they're asking for proof, this is just a matter of a phone call. I'm, not, I'm sorry, not a phone call, it's a matter okay. of a form letter. Uh -huh. Or you can go online nowadays. We actually, if you look at our website, we put the links for the three bureaus dispute tab right at the bureau's website. Why would I put that on our website, you might ask, and the lenders, I always tell clients why I put this there. I put it on our website because I wanted clients and lenders to see how easy it is to dispute stuff. A client can do this on their own in five minutes. This isn't something that I recommend anybody do, by the way, because this used to work 15 years ago, but now the creditors have caught on to people manipulating the system by using that 30-day timer to get things deleted. So people will lie and just say, hey, I don't think this is mine, I move, you know, this isn't mine, this isn't mine, prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it, right? Yeah. And then the credit bureaus get this request from a client that all of it really belongs to the client and the client knows it. And the credit bureaus have to investigate these accounts because the law says so. Now the client is just trying to game the system, so he's going this route, hoping that the bureau, the creditors don't respond in 30 days, yeah. hoping that the items get deleted. So the creditors caught on to people using that approach and they've actually built departments to help respond back and prove these accounts are accurate. Wow. So less and less items over the years I watched come off from this approach that other companies use. And in fact, the first two years we were in business, we started this using this approach. Um, and the reason why we stopped is because things were popping back up on the credit report. Mm -hmm. So a client would have something deleted, like a tax lien or a judgment or a late payment. And they enter into escrow because the lender now sees a higher credit score and they can qualify the client. Then the lender would pull credit at the end of escrow just to make sure nothing new popped up. But so what do you know? Those items that we deleted came back. back. And now the client's falling out of escrow and the lenders were unhappy with us because it wasn't working. See what I mean? I'm telling you, Joe, hey, use us and we can help you get more loans approved. And then two months after I enroll a client, the items you deleted got me into escrow or back. Now my client's out of escrow. I'm not going to keep sending you clients. Here's why. Remember the 30-day rule? Yes. They have to prove it in 30 days or else what? The credit bureaus do the deleting. So the creditors don't delete the account. The credit bureaus do. Because who, who records and receives information? The credit bureaus. Credit bureaus. And so if the credit bureaus don't receive the proof in 30 days, mm -hmm. they have an obligation to delete that account because they didn't yeah. get verification. But guess what? Let's say the creditor finally gets around to responding and proving an, accurate, an item's accurate. 60 days later, now all of a sudden they send the proof to the credit bureaus and the credit bureaus deleted it at day 30. But now day 60 they get proof, hey this client really did have a medical bill with Cedar sinai she didn't pay them. They're allowed There's to the do that even though they've maxed out the 30 days? Yeah, because oh, wow. they can re-report it and they just put it back on there. Yeah. Because it's really yours and they really proved it mm -hmm. belonged to you and they proved they reported it correctly. They just didn't do it in 30 days. So it yeah. got deleted by default but it came back because it was proved to be accurate. Okay, got it. And the difference with us is that we get it removed permanently. And here's how, okay? We go, now I'm gonna wipe all this, yes. take a picture. We use one step different here. Okay. So all of this is pretty much the same. I'm gonna wipe this because the numbers are a little different. Okay, so we got the dispute letters, four steps. Now we're going to do the approach that we use, the consumer law training approach, or pre-litigation approach. That's important to use because that's the term we use a lot, pre-litigation approach. Pre-litigation. What does that mean? Before litigation. 
We're not taking people to court. We're not filing court documents. We're not suing Macy's. It's a pre-litigation approach, which is like a threat of legal action. Yeah. That's what it really is. The only difference is one step here that supersedes all of them. Everything else is the same. That's why I left these up. Uh -huh. Now your first step is here. Step one. I want to write this out a little more in detail and clearly so you can have this because this is what we do. Step one, we threaten the creditor with legal action. How do we do that? We send a copy of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's an 84 page law. Pages. From the client directly to the creditor. And a threatening letter basically says, in a nutshell, hey, Macy's, you reported me late on May of 2015. Uh, I know I have a Macy's card with you, but I also know I was never late. Prove to me that I was late. Prove to me that you followed this law when you reported this information to the credit bureaus, or I plan to sue you for misreporting information about me. I know what my rights are. Here's a copy of the law for proof. Okay, that's what it says in a nutshell. Pretty much says that word for word, but that's pretty much what it says. We mm -hmm. threaten the creditor with legal action. We send a copy of the FCRA and demand proof. Why do we do that? In your best guess, why would I go to these guys and threaten Macy's? Why don't I just do what everybody else does and write a letter? Mm. It's okay if you don't know. The reason is because we don't want that creditor to respond in 30 days later on. Remember the 30 day thing? Yeah. The reason the creditors were responding back more and more often with the dispute letter approach is because more and more people were disputing stuff that were just trying to game the system, right? They were just trying to manipulate the system to get these items deleted with that 30-day timer. Well, what did I say was happening? Creditors were verifying accounts maybe 60, 90 days later, and these accounts were popping back up. So we took the approach that a consumer law attorney does, and this is an expensive approach. Um, consumer law attorneys really do this. They really charge clients about three to 5000 per person to do this. That's really what they charge to do this approach. The only difference between us and a consumer law attorney is they actually are attorneys. They have attorney letterhead. I'm representing Karen here. Here's a copy of the law for proof. Prove you followed this law. Mm -hmm. So na naturally, they might have a little better result because of that, but you, the client, sending that copy of the law in, threatening them in the same manner as an attorney, has usually the same effect. Okay. Okay, so we threaten the creditor with legal action and send a copy of the FCRA and demand proof. I hope you can read that. Yes, it's clear. Okay. <clears throat> then what do we do? Well, step number two is our old step number one. Oops, I messed up. Step number two is our old step number one. We ask the bureaus to look into the account. Same as a dispute letter, right? Yeah. Ask the bureaus to verify. That's step number two. So step number one, these happen simultaneously. So we go to the creditor with a copy of the law saying, hey, I'm gonna sue you, Macy's, you reported this about me, prove it, prove it, prove it, right? At the same time, we go to the credit bureaus and say, hey, Macy's reported me late, prove it. Macy's, they, they have, the credit bureaus have to open an investigation, remember, yeah. when the client demands it. Uh -huh. um, so we do this at the same time. What the credit bureaus do, unbeknownst to the credit bureaus, the client just threatened that creditor with a oh. copy of the law. So the creditor, credit bureaus don't know we just send a packet with 84 page copy of the law to the creditor. Mm -hmm. The credit bureaus do their job. They ask the creditor for proof, right? To prove two things. Right? Do they have to do two things? What are they asking the creditor to prove? What two things? Is it really theirs? Uh -huh. And uh, do they follow all the steps according do to the they FCRA? All the steps set up in the law. Good answer. Good job. So that's exactly what the credit bureaus do. They go, hey, Macy's, this client just said that you reported them late in May of 2015, and they're demanding proof. They're threatening us. They're, we're threatening the credit bureaus also. Mm -hmm. They're threatening us with lawsuits. Prove that, you, prove that they have an account with you. Prove they reported this payment late, or they missed this payment and prove he followed all these steps because now it could be on Macy's. They could be the ones liable. The credit bureaus can push the ownage on Macy's and Macy's could end up paying fines here. Yeah. So the credit bureaus are going to Macy's with their own threatening request, but they're the police. Remember, that's like posting a police officer up outside your house now. Mm -hmm. Your neighbors have been bitching about you missing the stop sign. We're going to be posted up here for about two weeks watching. All right, so this is a 30-day timer. 
Now it's step number four. The creditor must do what? They must do those two things within how many days? 30. Yep. So they must do, prove within 30 days. Yep. 30. One belongs to the client. Two reported correctly. Okay. They have to do that within 30 days. So at day 31, if the credit bureaus don't get that proof, what is the credit bureau's job? Report back to you. They have to delete it at 31 no, delete days. Delete it, yeah. And, and then for report back mm -hmm. to you. If they get that proof within 30 days, like day 29, they don't delete it and they report back to you. Okay. Yeah. So it's one of two things happens. It's always the same two things. You know, five. step five is, did they prove? Yes, remains, uh -huh. right? No, delete. Then update client. Mm -hmm. No, delete, update client. Those two things happen always, right here. So at step number five, the credit bureaus are looking for that response from the creditor with the proof of two things. And they basically ask themselves, did the creditor re respond? Yes, with proof. It remains, and we'll update the client. So hey, Karen, Macy's responded. They proved you were late in May of 2015. We're satisfied with their proof. They also proved they reported this information to us according to the law. The item staying on your credit report. It stays. And with pre-litigation, it's permanent deletion? It is. Um, I want to knock on wood there and tell, I'm going to teach you guys to say this the right way. Okay. In our experience of doing this for 14 years, uh, we've been doing this approach for about 12 of them, 11 to 12 years we've had three items come back on a client's credit. So they have had, we've had things come okay. back. We guarantee for one year for sure, and no charge, anything that pops back up, we'll go after it for free. We've only had three accounts come back. We've always gone after them for free. And we're actually able to remove them again. Okay. Because we submitted the proof that shows they weren't proved as accurate and they were removed again and never came back. Okay. Um, we always tell the clients that we guarantee these items are permanently deleted, but if any of them do happen to come back, we'll go after them for free within a year. Um, and then I tell them the truth. The truth is in the last 12 years that we've been doing this pre-litigation approach, only three things have come back. So it's not as in a sense 100% guaranteed mm -hmm. that these are permanent deletions because 0.001% of these items did come back. We yeah, it's a good deleted. stat over it's that long time. It's a pretty good stat. Time. It's confident that, like, if I say to you, Karen, 99.99% of the items we deleted stayed sounds off the report, good. it sounds pretty close mm -hmm. to permanent. But in truth, the permanent answer would be 100%. We didn't. We don't have that. Okay. But that's as close as it gets. Um, and we always will go after any account as long as the client can prove it's the exact same account. Okay. We, and whenever a client has said this, I've always done this. Um, do, you know, you got, you're doing a great job of those comparisons. You see the before and after reports. Mm -hmm. Well, clients will see on the after reports that we deleted a tax lien. We might delete it off of TransUnion and Equifax, but it's still on Experian, right? And then fast forward time, six months, they pull their credit out of car lot. They see the tax lien there, and in their mind, they don't see that it's only on TransUnion. It came they off think, Equifax uh -huh. and Experian. So what do they think? It came back. You guys deleted that for me, now it's back. And then they come in yelling, you guys said it was permanent, it's back. I say, oh my God, let's check and see, right? So sure enough, we pull up their analysis, we see that we removed the account off two of the three bureaus, uh -huh. it started with three, now it's on one. We look at their new report they're complaining about, and guess what, 95% of the time, 99% of the time, that account isn't it hasn't come back from the ones we deleted. The same account still exists, but the client's not aware of how to know what bureau it's on. Clients don't think like that. Clients don't think, oh, there's Equifax Experian and TransUnion, and this is only on TransUnion, and they removed it off the other two. They just see tax limit, and in their mind, it's back, because they saw that it was deleted, and now they see it's back. Yeah. See what I mean? So that's the real truth of the items coming back, is most of the time, it's not really the same item we removed. It's the item we didn't get off that's still there, and the client perceives it as coming back. Mm -hmm. Got okay? It. So the five-step approach, I'm going to run through it real quick here because this is important, um, the difference and then what we do and why it's so effective. The dispute letter approach, you, the client, just go to the credit bureaus with a form letter. 
unbeknownst to the creditor that you have a request coming, they have a request coming, you just go to the creditors and say, hey, Macy's reported me late, prove I wasn't late. They go to Macy's without any threat of legal action. The bureaus come over to Macy's and say, hey, this client said they were, they, they were you reported them late, prove it. Oh, well, here's proof. Boom, they send the proof over, it stays on there, they update the client, right? Where what we do, we go to the creditor and send a copy of the law and say, hey, Macy's, you reported me late. I don't think I was late. Prove that I was. If not, I'm going to sue you for misreporting information. Here's what the law says I'm allowed to do. And here's what you have to do. Here's the steps you have to follow. I know everything about the law. I'm a savvy client. I'm going to sue you unless you can prove this is accurate, right? Now Macy's goes, whoa, is this a late payment? You know what I mean? This client is trying to sue us, threatening all this major stuff or a late payment from two years ago. Okay, you know, this is pretty serious. Then we go to the bureaus, the client, at the same time says, hey, I was, Macy's reported me late, prove I wasn't. Now the request comes over from the bureaus to, to Macy's and they pull up the client's information, right? Macy's does, and they got this copy of the law, this threat of legal action, all notated on my file. Now the bureaus are sending a request over threatening me too. I know, meaning me, Macy's, that if I don't respond in 30 days, that most likely this whole threat of legal action is just gonna go away. I'm just gonna sweep this guy under the rug and give him what he wants, ignore the request, let the 30 day timer run its course and let the bureaus remove the late payment. Because Macy's doesn't care I got, if I got a late payment on my credit or not, do they really care? They care when, let's say I owe Macy's like five grand and a past due on them and I'm trying to get all that deleted. Mm -hmm. You could bet Macy's is probably gonna prove it's mine and prove it within 30 days. Because Macy's wants to get paid. They're using that as leverage to get paid when I'm currently defaulted. If it's something that happened in the past and Macy's has nothing to gain from it, they're not gonna invest the time it takes to respond back. They're gonna let the 30 day timer run its course. Does that make sense? Yes. So the creditor either verifies the account within 30 days, proving it belongs to the client, proving they reported it correctly, or they don't respond. And then the bureaus go, did they get a response with proof? Yes. If Macy's proved it, then it stays on the client's report. They update them. If no, we didn't get the proof in 30 days, they delete it and they update the client. Okay. So is that clear? Do you understand now why it's so important to threaten the creditor? The creditor has to see the client as a legal and viable threat, a savvy client, for them to be less likely to respond. Because remember what I said, over time, the creditors caught on that people were using that four-step approach to game the system. Yeah. It takes this aggressive approach that consumer law attorneys use, this pre-litigation approach, to get these items deleted and permanently removed because the creditors don't want anything to do with a client that's threatening legal action. Write these keywords down, um, if you can write while you're videoing. Okay. Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Equifax. So these are just keywords to search in Google and you'll get a whole slew of stories about this case. Portland, Oregon, Equifax and $18.6 million. That's enough keywords to search for a story that happened about three years ago. A lady was had an account on her credit show up. It was about a $200 account. It was a mistake, she knew it. She used the approach, the dispute letter approach, which is there to help clients like her that have something show up you're not aware of. And two of the three bureaus moved it immediately. So Experian and TransUnion removed this account immediately because they knew it wasn't hers, she proved it. Equifax didn't remove it right away. They left it on there and she kept fighting with them for two years, proving that it wasn't hers and they kept it on her credit. Somehow she ended up catching the attention of the Supreme Court and wow. it was she was trying to help her brother co-signing co for her disabled brother to get a car. Mm. I guess he wasn't fully disabled, but mm -hmm. anyway, she, she had caught the attention of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court made an example out of Equifax in this case and forced Equifax to pay her an $18.6 million fine for a $200 account <laughs> because they didn't follow the law and remove the account that was verified as inaccurate. So the reason I tell you that powerful story yeah. is because it shows you a real world example of this mm. in action and it shows you why the creditors and the credit bureaus don't want anything to do with somebody that's savvy and knows what their rights are. Yeah. Because cases like this are happening all the time. This is just one of them that made the news. Um, and the bureaus are paying big time for these kind of mistakes. And who's the, who owns the mistake? The bureaus. So even though Macy's reports this information to the bureaus and it's expected they follow the law, 
the bureaus have to go after Macy's for the mistakes. But who's ultimately the courts? Who are the old courts going to ultimately force to pay the fines? The bureaus. Why? Because it's on the bureaus to maintain only accurate and verifiable information about us. And remember what I said way back when I started this? There's no credit police out there. Mm -hmm. So the creditors and the credit bureaus are expected to follow the law. Yeah. But nobody's going to be checking them unless the client makes a request. Yeah. So like this lady made that request. Wow. Once the courts got once the bureaus got involved, they were supposed to clean up the mess. They didn't. Then the courts got involved and they slapped the fine on the bureaus. Not the creditor that reported the two hundred dollar mistake. The bureaus. So you see? Yeah. That's crazy. So that's the reason why we explain this that way because you really, and you even have to get that story in there, Karen. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't expect you to have all of that by Monday, but do me a favor, by Monday I want you both to do what I did. Mm -hmm. But all I want you to do is just explain the four-step approach and then the five-step approach okay. with the difference and what the key difference is and why it's so important we do that first step. And the truth is about 95% of the companies out there that claim to do credit repair are fly-by-nights, they run these out of the garage, um, they send in cookie cutter form letters. The reason I put those links on our website is because I wanted lenders and clients to know that it's that easy to do that. I could do, dispute all the stuff on my credit report in five minutes right now and pray that these guys don't respond in 30 days. days. But if I don't threaten the creditors first and say, hey, I'm a savvy client, I know what my rights are, here's a copy of the law for proof, I'm gonna sue you Macy's and all these other people, unless you can prove these are mine, or not mine, and prove that you reported it correctly. Um, that's a way different approach than just, it's called the spray and pray method. Sending in a dispute letter, which is just spraying a bunch of letters to the bureaus and praying some of them don't respond. Yeah. So that's the difference. Okay, so I'm gonna wipe that. All right. Give you a chance to take a break.